Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I love doing my podcast because I so enjoy bringing to you people who are focused on their own growth and development, and they're also committed to the development and growth of other people. And my guest today is doing this on a global basis. So you're going to be really interested in what she has to say. Um, My company also is very focused on this very area of growth and development. We're called Grow Strong Leaders, and we have tools and resources and books that are really valuable for helping people communicate and connect with each other more effectively at work. And you can learn more about that at growstrongleaders.com. Today, my very special guest is Jane Finette. Jane, welcome. Meredith, thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. Well, you know, I, this is just going to be such an important conversation. I want my listeners to take notes and also make note of how they can help in the very important topic that we're going to be discussing. And before we get into that, I want to give them a more formal introduction to you. Jane is the founder and executive director of the Coaching Fellowship. And this is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the development of young women leaders in social and environmental change. She's a leadership expert and a certified professional co-active coach. Jane has dedicated her life to achieving equality for women, empowering them to create impact and build the world of tomorrow today. She's the author of such an important book. I have it right here. It's called Unlocked, How Empowered Women Empower Women, which I feel is a must read to understand the challenges that women around the world have faced and are still facing today. As recently as last week, in the timing of this recording with the uh, Roe v. Wade decision by our Supreme Court. So Jane, our conversation today is just so important. As we get started, I think it would be helpful to give my listeners context because this has not always been your work as far as the, the coaching fellowship. You have quite the journey as a woman in the business world, specifically consumer technology. And I would love for you to describe how you went from that kind of world and what led you to the founding of the Coaching Fellowship? Absolutely. Thank you again, Meredith. And you're right. I, I mean, I definitely, I will often say, when you look at my resume, I look like I'm six different people. And I'm, I'm not terribly old, but I've done a lot of different things. And the early part of my career was focused in consumer tech. I was eBay for a long time. I ran software companies across Europe and I was at Mozilla, the folks behind the Firefox web browser for a good 10 years. Um, Used to head up European marketing. It was Mozilla that brought me to America. I'm British and they relocated me in 2009. Uh, and I used to head up all of retention for Firefox and ended my days at, at um, Mozilla as chief of staff to Mitchell Baker, the co-founder of Mozilla. And so it was, um, I used to talk about my job at Mozilla as really being the job of my life. At that time, I was responsible for about a half a billion Firefox users at one time. And uh, and what happened, the story of my transition was it was um, Mozilla who helped me get access to coaching and leadership development. Now, I had been very fortunate uh, throughout my career in tech to have lots of different trainings, lots of communication training, management training, conflict management training, you know, and so on and so Mm -hmm. forth. But I had never had an opportunity to really deeply work on myself, my leadership, what I was bringing to the table, my for the sake of what, why am I doing this? What do I really care about? What really matters? 
And I realized, I mean, I definitely have lived my life and done a lot of things which I would say I was absolutely on purpose. I was absolutely working at my best, being mission focused. Um, and there were also many times where I absolutely was not values aligned and um, mm -hmm. ultimately not very happy in my roles and not working at my best. And so having this opportunity at Mozilla to really understand who I was as a leader and what I wanted to create in this lifetime had me do some hard thinking. And um, I became very enamored with coaching. It is uh, an incredible gift to the world. And I believed that if I had had access to coaching and leadership development 25 years beforehand, I might have done some things differently. Uh, absolutely have no regrets. And um, getting full access to yourself, as I mentioned, those values, what do I care about? Also, what holds you back? I think are particularly important for young women leaders. Mm. So I said about creating my organization, the coaching fellowship, and that's exactly what we do. We create, uh, we've created opportunity for young women leaders in social and environmental change to get this gift of really fully understanding their leadership at a much earlier part in their career. And so what does that look like? What's the actual service you provide and how do you identify the people you're going to serve? Yeah, um, so uh, the last question first, so the, uh, the individuals, uh, it's an application process. So we, t we run two very big uh, fellowship programs a year serving about 150 women from all over the world. They apply to become part of the coaching fellowship. And if they're selected and we're looking at the, the women based on their potential on their uh, and so they're very early in their careers. So we're looking at their uh, what they're doing today and their potential for growth. And we're also looking at do they have an ability to self reflect already and are, would they be committed to this process? Is it the mm -hmm. right time for them? Uh, and also looking at what are they doing? So the scope and the scale of their impact in the world. And when we, when they've been selected and invited to join the coaching fellowship, they then get six months of access to working one on one with an executive coach. And they also become part of our vast network now of these incredible young women social change leaders. So we've worked with about 1500 women over the last years, uh, more than 80 countries represented and if I might, you know, they're, they're very uh, doing very different things, but all things which are, are making the fundamental difference. So we're working with young women working with indigenous populations in the Amazon, we're working with women uh, working um, for wildlife and conservation projects in Africa, cleaning drinking water across uh, East Africa, inner city community development uh, across Detroit, Chicago. Um, so they're, you know, very, very different kind of roles that these young women are doing, but they are absolutely in the field boots on the ground uh, and doing the impactful work that we so, yeah, at the moment we so desperately need, we've got a lot of big problems in the world to, to well, be solving. Well, we do. And I'm curious if you see some common challenges that no matter what country they're in, what are some of the common challenges that you're seeing these young women face? Yes, oh, absolutely. And you know, it used to break my heart, Meredith, in the beginning. Um, so um, I, I used to read, you know, it was just Jane doing this. Now we're a team of four. We're a very small nonprofit still. But in the beginning, I read every single application. And at one point in the very early days, you know, we'd get 700 applications and uh, it was it would take weeks. And it was heartbreaking because more than 90 percent of the applicants would tell me when I said, what do you want to work on with a coach? How would life be different if you got what you needed and wanted from coaching? And more than 90 percent of the of the uh, applicants would say, I need to work on confidence. I need to work mm -hmm. on being a more confident leader. And it would. Oh, it would. And we still have that. We absolutely still have it. But I was able to re really recognize that they weren't asking me for money. They weren't asking me for a connection to Bill Gates or, you know, <laughs> just to Jeff Bezos or whoever. They were asking 
for help for themselves. And that was absolutely something that we could help them with. You know, that was absolutely within the world, the realms of possibility. Um, we also see a lot of them are very early in their careers. So they're first time leaders, first time managers, be that as a project lead or starting to manage other people and wanting to empower them forward as well. So um, not only sort of the negative things to work on, if you might say, like, how do I overcome some things that are holding me back, but also, well, how do I get more? How do I do and be more? And isn't that wonderful? So, um, and then the last years, it won't be a surprise to you, of course, but in particular, uh, burnout, um, very big challenges in the, in the impact space with the global pandemic, um, nonprofits already re under-resourced, uh, being uh, in high demand, seeing that rise ever more so in the last years. So nonprofits doing even more with less funding. So um, being able to support those individuals as well in, in coaching their own well-being and putting that oxygen mask on first before they help others is mm. such an important lesson for this demographic. You know, as you were describing the confidence piece, I was thinking is so many of your participants are first time leaders, you know, just stepping into something new and different. It yes. would be, uh, I can see where confidence would be a key thing for them because it's unknown. They, they don't have all the experience yet that they will be gaining over time that builds that confidence. So it seems like it's a crucial time to be able to get that coaching. There's a statistic I want to ask you about because this is kind of, not kind of, it's very disturbing. According to the World Economic Forum, women lost 36 years of progress in 2020 alone. So I know this is a, a statistic that you're very familiar with. So talk about what do we mean by that? What did they lose and why? What happened? Yeah, wow. Gosh, it's, I mean, you have to, well, sort of even before the pandemic, when you look at the global numbers for women, whether we're look, talking about women in positions of power and influence, I mean, we made marginal gains. They were still, you know, we, we still had a long way to go. So when COVID hit and uh, Antonio Gutierrez, UN um, uh, uh, chief, also said that we had been set back a, a generation uh, from the pandemic. So what we saw, particularly in America, uh, was, of course, um, and many, many women in America are employed in the consumer service sector. So that would be in shops, either working part time or, or working three jobs part time so they can take their kids to school and or maybe do some night school and so on. So they're working multiple jobs. They're all in the consumer service sector, hotels, shops, uh, restaurant industry. And of course, these were all of the businesses which were the first to be uh, to be shuttered with, uh, with the lockdowns. Then we saw uh, you know, many, many other fortunate women, of course, being able to work from home. Maybe they work in, the, in technology and other sectors, which it just lent itself very well from working from home. But then what did we see for that? We saw uh, the children being at home, needing homeschooling, elder care, all of the other crazy things that we were having to do and manage our lives to buy toilet paper and, you know, just manage life. Um, and families were starting to have to make decisions about who was going to manage this. And when women are in positions of less uh, power and influence and earning 82 cents on the dollar to every, every uh, male counterpart, and it just made good sense that those women would also take a step back. So they were also leaving the workforce. So um, Oxfam says actually we lost 64 million jobs uh, across the world. That was, a, that was a global number. But what we have in America now is there are less women in the workforce today than there was 30 years ago. Mm. And so women are starting to slowly come back into the workforce but they are coming back at with less pay, with less positions, and they still need that flexibility. They still need the part-time work. Um, and um, so we are, uh, this is going to take a very, very long to, very long time to resolve. In addition, if you look at 
uh, other global numbers, uh, 32 million girls didn't go to school today. And that wasn't because they didn't want to. You know, they face threats of sexual violence on the way to school, at school. Uh, they're not deemed important enough to go to school. Um, it, many, many reasons. Um, and the Malala Fund, a global uh, nonprofit from Malala, who was, of course, attacked by the, the Taliban 10 plus years ago, says another 20 million girls will be added to that list due to the global pandemic. So they will not be going back to school. And I don't have to even tell you about the girls in Afghanistan, of course, in the last the last year. So, um, yes, we de when you say we lost 36 years of progress, whether that is women and their economic uh, uh, um, freedom and independence, whether it is their ability to uh, have an education, um, we saw rates of sexual violence increasing. And as you were mentioning, just as we started the, the podcast together, um, now we have the, the, um, the subject of our own bodies and being able to make decisions about our own future. Um, so there are many, many jobs that we still need to be done for women's equity. Yes. Well, speaking of that, what do you see as potential plus possibilities, I guess, for for gender equality for women, because you've just painted the picture of why we lost a lot of ground. But what, in your opinion, represents, say, the, the bright spot? What are some things you're seeing that might give us hope? Oh, uh, my gosh. No, and there is happen? so much. Oh, Meredith, this is this is this is why I'm so passionate about what we're doing, because the world gets better when women thrive, everybody thrives, everybody. Women create virtuous circles. So when you help one woman, you're not just helping her, you're helping everyone around her. USAID did a study many years ago now, and it was about women in the developing world. And they said that when you help one woman in the developing world, she will give back more than 90% of those resources to everyone around her. Mm. So whether that was food or money or knowledge or whatever she had, she would be giving it back to her family, to her community and, yeah, and the world. For men, it was between 30 and 40%. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think you can, as women on the phone, uh, on the on the call here, you, um, you can understand um, that we are pouring so much more back into what we do. So it is absolutely, um, you know, tenfold increases when you help one woman. And so what we see, and the data is absolutely concrete, is that when there are more women at the negotiating table, we have longer lasting peace. They say that when women get access to agricultural tools, to seeds, even to land, which women are in many, many countries are not even allowed land ownership rights, 150 million people would not have gone hungry today. 150 million people would not have been hungry. Um, and then you look at reduction in infant mortality, increases in literacy, and $12 trillion being added to the global economy by 2025 if women and girls were empowered. Mm. So, I mean, I but why are we not doing this already? Like, why are we not doing this like yesterday? This is, it's unbelievable that all of this prosperity, all of this, uh, whether it's well being, uh, food po poverty, even if the only thing you care about is money. Like the global GDP numbers will be would skyrocket if all women and girls were empowered. Mm. So it's um, yeah, every indice is for the positive when women and girls are fully able to live their lives and live their potential. Well, one of the things that's such a strength of your book, and I'm going to keep and you know encouraging people to get yeah. this unlocked. You lay out ten different things that women can do. We'll get to men later, but that women can do for each other. And I would love for us to spend a few minutes at least addressing two or three of those that you are particularly passionate about. By the way, I love the passion you have <laughs> you. speaking about this because it shows you're doing the right work because you deeply care. It comes across so clearly in how you talk about this. So let's help my listeners understand 
that they don't have to go start a coaching fellowship. They don't have to look at some monumental project to undertake. There are things we can do, I can do. And I would love for you to articulate some of those so they get a clear picture of how practical and simple it can be. Yes. Thank you. And I, uh, I, would, I would add thank you for, for saying this because I did, this is why I wrote the book was because the problems that we take, you know, a few minutes back, they seem insurmountable, you know, insurmountable. There is so much to do. Um, and yes, we need uh, rules changed, laws updated. We need an end to racial and, and gender systemic bias. These are multi-generational things which should have been happening already. And what are the things that we can do as women today to make a difference in another human's life? And that was where I wanted to, to point us because when I went back and I kind of did almost an internal audit of, well, how, who were the women that helped me in my career and what did they do? And I was, ex I was expecting someone to have opened a door for me and shepherded me on my way. And actually it was always in the very small deeds, in the very small moments where someone gave me a boost that I needed that kept me going when I thought I was going to quit or encouraged me that said, it's okay if you move and you leave your all of your family in Europe. If you want to move to America, you should do it, you know, go try it. If you don't like it, come back, you know. And these were the things which I thought, wow, gosh, yes, if this is if, if this was how I was empowered, that is within the realms of possibility for us all. Mm -hmm. So the one of the very first ones, and it's the number number one key in the book, and it's just an easy one to get started with, which is just say yes. So if a woman comes to you and she asks for help, she's like, Can you can you give me some feedback? Can I unpack this email with you? Um, can I just, uh, can I ask for advice? Would you give me an introduction to someone? Just say yes, because it is so hard for women to ask for help. And so if she's got to the point that she's asking for help, say yes, if you can. And if you can't, please also say no, I can't, but keep going. I'm really rooting for you because we know you can't, we can't all do everything all of the time. So it is important for women to also be able to say no, <laughs> yeah. but where you can say yes and let her know that she is valid and that you, if you, even if you can't help today, she'll keep going and she'll ask somebody else. Um, switching gears, getting a little bit heavier. My most favorite key from the book is um, pretty taboo. I still think it's taboo, um, which is, it's key number five, and that is actually talk about money. And you think, wow, that's, that's for, for some people, it is a fun conversation. But for most women, talking about money is not the most fun conversation. In fact, Sally Krawcheck, the founder of Elevest, the it's now $1 billion fund, women's investment fund, says that, uh, and forgive me for being a little crass here, that she says, you know, women would rather tell you what they did last night in the bedroom than they would talk about money. And um, they are, you know, we, we have shame when we have money. We have shame when we don't have money. And we don't have financial literacy. And the thing about money is that whoever owns the most money and has the most money gets to decide what's most important and what are the problems worth solving. And so we have to work hard as women to get more comfortable, more literate with money and make that money work harder for us. We need it for our, independ our independence. We need it for wealth creation for our families. And when we do something with that money, we actually, uh, we invest it differently. So we invest in sustainable businesses. We invest in green tech. We invest in education. We invest in healthcare. Um, so that money then uh, is another virtuous circle. So th there's quite a bit of, uh, of data, but women hold about 70% of their assets in cash. Women also earn 82 cents on the dollar, as I was saying earlier. And we have um, very little financial literacy. So what that can transpire to, and this number is horrific, I think, for the United States and why we should be caring for each other as sisters, is that by the time we're 65, women are 80%, have an 80% potential, so it is potential, to retire into poverty. 
Hmm. So all of that, if we're saving our money, we're not earn well, we're not earning as much money, then we put it in savings so it doesn't work as hard for us as as our male counterparts. We live longer, we live alone longer, and we're more likely to have health problems because we are aging uh, longer as well. Then the possibility of poverty is is a very real thing for women. So actually talking about money, if you say, what does that mean? It's like have an awkward conversation with someone about with another woman in your life about money, because we don't talk about it enough. And I know I know my husband talks about investments. I know he talks about the business thing he heard of. And we are not prepared to do that. It is rude. It is uh, shameful. Um, maybe we don't feel confident. And so we will never get the confidence if we don't even start to explore what does this look like for another woman in my in my community mm -hmm. well thinking of money i was um imagining uh, my daughter is a financial advisor so oh. she loves talking about money with her client Great. and and is really a future-oriented person so she's excellent in what she does and what i love about her as a parent is she's got two kids the seven-year-old opened up a savings account not long ago uh -huh. and her son she took recently to open up his because now he was old enough to do that but it's this whole idea of parents it has to start with the parents talking to kids about money and how they it can does. save and and buy something and so do you have any specific suggestions for parents on what they can do and especially it sounds like we have this gender differential in how yeah. people, I know when I was growing up, well, you know, many, many years ago, there was a real difference in how the girls were treated and the boys were treated it, when it came to money, cars, whatever. It is and absolutely so, true. What, so it is the opposite. Yeah. yeah the um, tips that you could give to parents who are eager to make sure they don't accidentally send different messages to their sons and their daughters about money. Yes. And I will and I love to say this, Meredith, is that little girls are still taught that it's rude to talk about money. They should be careful with it. Like, whoop, don't spend it all at once, you know? I mean, how many times have we heard that? Um, and that uh, they should save it. They should take care of it, save it. And yet we're teaching our little boys that money is a vehicle. Money is useful. This will get you from A, not just to B, but to C, D, E, you know, whatever you want. But it is something to be uh to work hard for you so i'm i and i don't want little boys to stop this is a great message just let's apply it to our daughters as well and let's make sure that we're not persisting that bias of oh no no no, no. it's really rude for our little girls to talk about money it is mm -hmm. absolutely not the the number of financial articles so this is still living out in the world today 70% of articles, uh, financial articles aimed at men are about investing. 90% for women are about saving still. You know, look wow. at Good Housekeeping magazine, how to save money doing this, how to, you know, it's all saving. Yes. Where do you see investing articles in Martha Stewart's magazine? You know, it's, it's all about, uh, and we are excellent budgeters. I mean, I think of my mom, my mom ran her house. She, she, there was no flies on her. She knew how to run at, down to the, you know, to the pennies in our house. But if there was any additional wealth or income, which there wasn't that much, but my dad took care of that. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, you're so right. The, not only what are we teaching them, but also as models. So as, as a mom and a dad, yeah, like the kind of conversations that we have back and forth and we watch, what does our mom do? What does our dad do? Um, they do over many, many years compound and affect how we, how we show up. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's so much to unpack and think about with what you're saying that I really want to encourage my listeners to just in general, think about how do you think about money? How do you talk about money with others or not? Uh, you know, what does that say about your beliefs about money? And also how we talk about men and women, so many differences that um, are these unconscious biases 
that we bring because of what we've heard growing up, what we hear around us with whoever it is we surround ourselves with. And so those are some great um, areas of awareness to to, um, bring up for women. And, you know, there's so much men can do to support equality for women as well. And I have a lot of male listeners. And so I don't want them sitting there thinking, well, what, this doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. How you talk about money to other, to your family members, how, you know, just thinking about spouses, how do you each describe or what roles do you automatically take on based on how you grew up? And just having these open discussions with uh, your partner, I think are so critical, but let's get practical for the men. What are some things that they could do that would help them, that would allow them to be supportive of the women in their lives? Yes, and I, uh, it's, it's wonderful. You know, when I wrote my book and it was launched, I was so shocked that uh, the first person to share on social media about my book and the first person to leave me an Amazon review was a man. And I was so taken back and so it it touched me in a way that it's hard to describe. And so um, I know we have so many fantastic male allies and, um, and I do think that my, that my book, by the way, I think is used, you know, it's, it's, it's written about how empowered women empower women, but if men are also interested in learning more about more of the challenges that we're facing, it definitely is a good, there's a lot of data in there to, to, to review. In terms of, of what you can do, there, there's an awful lot. You are, st- as, as our male allies, you are still in rooms that women can't, can't yet be part of. Um, you are still part of conversations that we are not part of. So uh, we need you to be a voice. You need to, uh, to be an ally for us in those rooms. Very practically, uh, one of my favorite things about men is the money. So you 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 talked about that already. Meredith is fantastic. And I think for me, uh, the two other pieces. So first of all, uh, network. So um, women are not, we are not fantastic at building networks. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole other suite of things that go, go along with uh, why we're not so great at networking. But men are, do have the potential to open doors for us that we can't for ourselves. So wherever you can, first of all, as a, as a man, instill the importance of why you should be building a network. We know 85% of jobs are filled through network and also the size of your network will directly correlate to your potential for a raise and your potential to be promoted. So we need to ensure that women understand this is an important part of your job and your career. And then likewise, start by opening some doors, start by making some introductions and check in with that person that they are continuing to build their networks. One of the most important things you can do, especially for young women leaders, because the network compounds over time, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're starting at 55, you know, we got a lot of work to do, but if you're starting at 25, I mean, I know people who are the CEOs of this, that, and the other, but I worked with them when I was 21. It was my first job, you know? And so uh, we've all got stories like this, but we must start as early as possible. And the other thing, and this goes a little bit back to you're in the room where we're not, women are over-mented and under-sponsored. And what I mean by that is we don't have enough people who are uh, speaking on our behalf, who are rallying on our behalf. And so uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence that women are hired on experience and men are hired on potential. But if you're also a young woman starting your career, you don't have that experience yet. So you are not getting hired. That is, that is another bias uh, which we need to address. But when we have a male ally who's advocating, oh, you know, this, this young woman, she's fantastic. You know, she should be put forward for this promotion or this big project. She's equally as good. I've seen her. Um, we need you to be that sponsor and be that voice to recommend someone moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the those are the really uh, big ones for me. But the um, uh, you know, I I'm just it's been wonderful experience since my book came out to have so many men come and say I want to help. I I don't know how, and yet these, even those small things I just mentioned can make a significant difference in, in a woman's career. 
Yes, and thinking in a in a specific kind of situation in the workplace, <clears throat> if a male observes someone making a comment to a woman that is not, and I don't mean it's sexually inappropriate, but just a put down or something that's not right, what is a way that that male who notices that can speak up on behalf of this person, this woman, not to say she can't defend herself, but we need those other men to say, hey, yeah. that's not right. Yeah. What, what are you seeing there in terms of men and how they can handle those kinds of situations to really advocate for women? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it does depend on the situation. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I have this a little bit in my book where I, it's, uh, which is we have to take a stand at some point things are so inappropriate or it's not right that we have to take a stand. And this feels like it's the most riskiest thing that we that we will do. And and I think that can feel risky for men too. Like, ooh, what if I intervene? Like, how will that look for me? Um, and what are the repercussions of, of that? So I think you have to assess the situation. Um, would I like to see them jump in and say, hey, you know my friend that was not that was not an appropriate thing or please let my female colleague finish her sentence or speak or she had just said that five minutes ago in the conversation did you all not hear that whatever it might be mm -hmm. and if that is not really appropriate but then to be able to take someone aside later and say hey you know i didn't want to you know embarrass you in front of everyone because maybe that doesn't serve the lesson um right. but rather let me let me tell you how i would have handle this or do you think about the potential of your uh unintended the unintended consequences of what what just happened mm -hmm. um so i think that you know i really have to give folks respect that they choose how and when to address these things but if you certainly see it and you don't do anything then we are perpetuating the cycle yeah and i honestly think i mean a lot of guys they're um, and, you know, we're all biased. I was going to say, you know, guys, we don't know when we're doing it. All people don't know when we're doing it. You know, we're we're all um, afflicted with bias. I think there's something like mm -hmm. 200 plus biases. And that's OK. Sometimes we'll forget. Sometimes we'll just not even realize. But to be coachable and to uh, to come with grace and with an openness to, to let someone know, oh, I this happened. This is what I noticed. Like, you know, I would have done this a little differently and so on, just to, to coach people through it. And if it is absolutely unacceptable, then yeah, then I think you need to go to the top and you need to make complaints and get people struck off um, mm -hmm. if, if, if it gets to that extreme. Yeah, I think that's an underlying theme of what you're saying. And in your book is this speaking up on behalf of as a yeah. way of empowering someone else. You know, I just think that the, and, and to me, it all goes back to being aware and noticing. Yes. You know, noticing our language, noticing our what we're hearing from others and pointing out when when somebody is saying something that reflects a belief or an opinion that maybe needs to be questioned whether it's their attitude about money or about another gender, there are so many areas where we can all learn and grow. And Jane, I could talk to you about this for quite a while, but what I want to do is give you a, a minute to talk about not just how people can contact you and get a copy of your book, but how could it tell us what the coaching fellowship, are you looking for coaches? Is there a way people can serve you and your wonderful organization and the work that it's doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith. Yes, um, so the Coaching Fellowship, uh, it's tcfs.org, or if you search for the, the Coaching Fellowship on um, uh, Google or, or web browsers, you'll, you'll, find, uh, you'll find us. Um, and uh, we're always looking for coaches. Um, we do have a pretty strong coach bench. We're, we have about 220 volunteer coaches from 30 countries these days. So if you're an international coach as well, we're always looking to grow our global uh, footprint. And um, and also um, talking about money, I hope this is okay, but um, sure. as, a, as a nonprofit, also if you're 
so motivated in terms of um, and moved by our work in helping young women in social change and always uh, donation gifts are, are greatly, greatly appreciated um, to do our work. Um, my book is on Amazon and all, and yes. all um, books, local bookstores, if you want them to get it in. I was just in my darling little bookstore here in Niwot in uh, Colorado and they had put it in the window and I, I, I wept every <laughs> day. It was so wonderful um, and so wonderful because these are our small bookstores that really need our support and our help too. So uh, that's so important. Um, and I would always love to connect with people. When we talk about network, I'm always wanting to rephrase it as not building network, but building community. And so yes. you would find me on LinkedIn. Just let me know that you heard Meredith and I in conversation. And I'd love to, I'd love to hear from from people. The more we are connected, the more we can support each other. So yes, that would be I wonderful. think it's those connections. I think of that even more than the word network is just connecting with people and like you say, building a community. And Jane, we'll put all of these links to your book, to your LinkedIn profile, to your um, website on our show notes page. So people will always be able to go there and find that. I want to thank you for the important work you're doing for the vision that you have for equality for women. And I just you know, admire you and really support everything you're doing and Thank you for being who you are in the world and the contributions you're making that really are transforming the lives of young women throughout the globe. Thank you so much, Meredith. You know, I say that um, gender equity is the unfinished business of our of our times and uh, here us all working together, you know, it is possible and more. And I thank you so sincerely as well for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.